welcome our next speaker, Ernest Frankel, who will talk about system biology, where computer science, engineering, and biology meet. Hi, so as Monty Python likes to say, now for something completely different. I'm going to talk to you about biology, not computer science, but I'm going to show you how the algorithms of the type that are being developed here at MSR have really had the potential and the effect of having a big impact on how we understand biology. But for those of you from the math or computer science background, I might have called this talk, Biology Looks Hopelessly Complex. It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> and you'll see what I mean. Let's, um, let's start with what apparently is a simple disease. It's a disease called Huntington's, and you don't have to be a neurobiologist to be able to tell the difference between the brain of a patient who does not suffer from Huntington's on the right and the brain of the patient with Huntington's on the left. Tremendous loss of, of brain structure there. Now, the origin of this disease is a mutation in a single gene. And so you would think that this would be a case where we could really understand how mutations cause disease and therefore be able to figure out how to cure disease. But this uh, mutation has been known for approximately 20 years, and it's led to no effective cure, and certainly uh, no effective cure, but not even effective treatment. That's because the effect of biological molecules is extremely complex. A single gene, when mutated, affects lots and lots of biological processes. And the traditional approaches to studying these diseases are not getting us the kinds of answers that we need. And so in systems biology, what we're trying to do is make a whole series of very systematic measurements of what goes on in the cell. Pretty much any property we can effectively measure, we want to measure, and then use computa uh, computational approaches to build up relatively coherent views of what all those data mean and allow us to understand how signals transfer uh, through different parts of the cell and where we might be able to go and intervene and uh, cure diseases. What things can we measure? Well, since the uh, genomic revolution, now that we can measure uh, sequence lots and lots of genes, we can measure the expression of lots of different genes in an organism. We can measure lots of things about proteins. We can measure lots of things about metabolites. And we can try to collect all of these different data together. And so these different uh, uh, genomic, proteomic, omic technologies um, have the benefit of being comprehensive, but they also have some severe, severe uh, deficiencies. When we look at multiple different kinds of data applied to the same problem, well, well, what we typically find is that they don't tend to tell us the same story. So here we've got a sort of yellow data and blue data and green data representing different technologies applied to the same biological problem. And you see the Venn diagram doesn't overlap very much. And that's um, a, a difficult problem when we're trying to understand what's going on. We also have a lot of false positives and false negatives in these data. What we try to do in this omic approach is to try to understand how all of these data could really arise from a single biological process. And so in this cartoon, you've got some cell surface receptor on the outside of a cell detecting its environment. And it sends information into the cell and talks to lots of different proteins. And then those proteins can send information down into the nucleus where it can change gene expression. And we might find, you know, the, the blue technology tells mostly about one kind of protein, uh, one kind of process, and the yellow technology tells more about another kind of process. But there is some underlying physical reality. And so we're going to turn to algorithmic approaches, particularly uh, graph theory, to see if we can uh, discover what those, uh, what those commonalities are, what the underlying biological process is that gave rise to these uh, apparently uh, dis um, disparate data. But the problem, this is where it gets worse before it gets better, is that when we try to do that, we end up with these network structures that are just too complex for human beings to understand. And so we need to come up with algorithms that allow us to find the interesting part of all these many interactions among hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different proteins and genes. And so what we've done is turn to a uh, class of algorithms called prize-collecting Steiner trees. And in this approach, we uh, have nodes and edges. The nodes represent either proteins or genes. And the, upper, uh, the edges represent potential interactions among these proteins or genes, physical interactions. And then we try to find a subset of the data from, say, the genes and proteins that we think are changing in, in the disease state, indicated by the color, the yellow and the green, that are connected to each other, possibly directly, but possibly through these hidden nodes, proteins and genes that we didn't measure in our experiments because our experiments aren't perfect, but are nevertheless important for the disease process. And so when we apply this prize-collecting Steiner tree algorithm, it takes that very complicated graph and finds a subgraph that's most important for the biological in, uh, problem of interest. And the algorithm can try to decide whether some data point which sort of lies on the edge of our graph is so relevant that it has to include it, or whether it's likely to be a false positive and should be excluded. 
Now, when we do this on uh, real biological data, then we can get insights into what the context are of the genes that we detect as being relevant to the disease. So here we've got a bunch of yellow proteins that are functioning in similar process, and we can then learn what kinds of processes are going on. And we can also find nodes in these networks that are very central and might be places where drugs could be used to target this uh, altered process and restore health to the organism. So an example where we've actually started to apply this is something called glioblastoma. It's a very devastating brain tumor. It's usually diagnosed at a late stage. Uh, the only treatment really is surgery combined with chemotherapy. Without it, patients uh, survive very, very short times. With this treatment, they survive usually uh, a year or less. So the treatment is obviously uh, not very good. So we've taken a model of this disease where we have one gene that's been mutated that's very common mutation in glioblastoma. And we're looking at the effect of that gene on the rest of the cell. And we've collected all these different omics kinds of technologies, and we've built a graph from those data. And in this graph, the red nodes are ones where there's experimental data. And then the circles that don't have color in them are ones that the algorithm is telling us are, most re are also relevant to the disease. And when we look at this, we immediately can uh, decompose into subgraphs that tell us a lot about the biological processes involved. Some of those are ones that are rich in red. Those are ones where there's a lot of experimental data. And some of them have a lot of clear circles. Those are ones where the algorithm is telling us that they're relevant to the disease process. But the experimental data by itself would not have led us in those places. And so that can lead us to new hypotheses as to what to look at. And the other thing that's extremely exciting about this is now we can find potential new drug targets. And we can do that by looking for the nodes in this network that are most central. So the single most central node in this particular network is a uh, protein called SARC. And actually, it's been shown that if you target SARC and the mutation that is, uh, is affecting these particular cells, so the EGF receptor mutation, those two mutations, um, I'm sorry, targeting those two proteins simultaneously has a very strong effect on blocking the growth of these tumor cells. And so that is a potential for a combinatorial therapy that would be much better than individual treatments, one uh, and the, after the other. And now we can start working our way down this list of most central nodes and do experiments. So this was an expected result. Our next uh, most central node was something that was very surprising to us. Um, it's a, a gene that doesn't seem to have any known biology associating it with glioblastoma. But we can actually go into the laboratory now and test whether uh, treating that node with the drug has an effect on the growth of these tumor cells. And sure enough, we can stop growth of these tumor cells with that. And if we combine that, uh, treating that node with the, most, the node at the top of the network, we actually get more than an additive effect on blocking the growth of these tumor cells. And so what I hope I've been able to give you a taste of is that we can take these incredibly complicated biological problems where we don't know how to uh, come up with treatment and do very systematic measurements through all these different kinds of omic technologies and then apply the kinds of algorithms developed here at MSR to really develop models that allow us to directly go in and decide what to test experimentally and hopefully lead us uh, to new ways of treating disease. The work that uh, I described to you is largely done by the three women on the top left, Carol Huang, S.D. Eger Lotham, and Laura Riva in my laboratory with a lot of wonderful collaborations from people at MIT, shown on that side of the graph, and at MSR uh, here as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ernest, for the wonderful talk. And we have time for questions. I encourage people to please go to the microphone. Unless you have a one-word question, you can shout, because if he has to repeat three sentences, it takes a while. Nobody even. <laughs> can you tell us what the special protein you found was? Yeah, so when, um, when Carol first showed me the results of this uh, computation, I told her, oh, this doesn't look too good, because the second most central note there is the estrogen receptor, which um, I'm sure most of you know about estrogens as being uh, a female hormone, and it has no obvious relationship to brain tumors. But it actually turns out that glioblastoma is much more common in men than in women. And so we had a little bit of hope that maybe this wouldn't turn out to be a total red herring. And sure enough, our experiments in the laboratory seem to be confirming that at least in this uh, cell culture model of what's going on, we can block the growth of these tumor cells. And maybe someday it'll lead to an effective treatment as well. Yeah? Uh, so you said that things are going to get much more complex before they're going to get simple. I'm wondering if there's a sort of a middle ground possible where you use very complex algorithms, come up with a hypothesis which may even surprise everyone. But then once you have the hypothesis, there are simpler algorithms to confirm the very validity. I mean, how much can you trust this very, very complex algorithm and its output? That, that's, that's a great question. And I don't think we can trust it in the sense of 100% confidence. What the goal of this is, uh, from my perspective, is leading us to do better experiments. 
So if we start with the whole human genome, the whole human proteome, we have too many possible things to test. We can't, um, we can't explore all the possibilities. By using these algorithms, we can focus in on the parts of the, the proteome where we could actually try to do experiments. And if we, our success rate is 1 in 10, that's still better than 1 in 20,000. OK, so let's say, oh, oh, sure, shout your question. Sure. Has to be one, one word, though, right? Yeah. Uh, What diseases do we focus on and what do we do with these targets when we find them? So we've been focusing on a number of different diseases. Uh, some of them are uh, chosen because they're devastating and anything we can make progress on would make a big difference. So Huntington is something we work on in our lab, glioblastoma I've told you about. Uh, some of them are extremely common ones, like uh, type 2 diabetes, which is uh, um, becoming much more common uh, in the developed world with increasing obesity. Um, and these are diseases where uh, people have tried to do all the obvious experiments, and so taking a completely unbiased view might lead us in very different directions and potentially have a very big payoff. What do we do with the results? Well, the primary thing we do with them is try to get them out there to a larger community. To communi so we do some experiments in our laboratory to test and try to find the most, uh, most plausible things. But then the goal is to really expand this knowledge and send it out uh, to other people can confirm it in other models of diseases, and then hopefully the pharmaceutical industry pick it up as well. Okay, let's thank Ernest again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.